Amen. Some of what we look at today, probably most of it will seem like revision. Uh, it's things that were covered in Arkansas, but also going back to Italy. I want us to consider uh, our lines, our four main lines, the line of the 144,000, the line of the priests, the Levites and the Nethanims, bringing in some of those other things that we have um, been noting. So if we consider the line of the 144,000, it begins at the time of the end in 1989. Then we mark 9-11. Our next way mark, Sunday Law. Close of probation. And second advent. From 1989, the time of the end, and 9-11, the two new waymarks um, that we've studied out in this movement, but then the ones we know from the great controversy of Sunday Law, close of probation and second advent. We can overlay on top of this Millerite history, which we know is also uh, a template for our time. So 1989 is what in Millerite history? 1798, also the time of the end from Daniel 11 verse 40. 9-11, what is 9-11? August 11, 1840. What I want to note, um, because we're developing a particular theme, I want to note April 19. April 19, 1844. Sunday law is what in Millerite history? July 21. 1844, the Boston uh, camp meeting. Close of probation, October 22. So those are our dates from Millerite history. 1798, April 19, 1844, July 21st as Sunday law and October 22 as close of probation. This is from a pamphlet uh, by Joseph Bates, written in 1847. So it's 1847, J.B. Joseph Bates, B.P. 2, 72.1, but I'll just read this one out for you. Speaking of this time, Joseph Bates says, At midnight a cry was raised. When is midnight that the cry was raised? July 21. July 21 being midnight and midway between April 19 and October 22. So he's pointing to the Boston Tabernacle and he says, At midnight, July 21, a cry was raised. The bridegroom is coming. Go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. We have already shown that the tarrying time for the bridegroom by the prophetic period was six months, beginning the 19th of April down to October 22, 1844. The midnight of this dark, stupid time would be about July 20th. He's off by one day. Samuel Snow gave the true midnight cry in the tabernacle in Boston at this time, and it was received by the virgins in a different light from what it ever was before. He says he had been trying to make people believe it before, but without effect. But now it began to move with rapid progress. God was giving the light by his spirit. Next paragraph. 
At midnight, in the dead of the night of this tarrying of the bridegroom, the cry was raised, which caused great agitation and excitement, looking with unparalleled interest at definite time, tenth day of the seventh month. This is Boston. Next paragraph. A camp meeting was held in Concord, New Hampshire, somewhere about the 1st of August. Here, as we afterwards learned, the cry resounded throughout the camp. On the 12th of August, another was held in Exeter, New Hampshire. On my way there, something like the following seemed to be continually forcing upon my mind. You are going to have new light here, something that will give a new impetus to the work. So he's marked three camp meetings. He's begun at, by marking Boston. Then he's identified August 1 as Concord. And then beginning August 12, I know Samuel Snow doesn't arrive there till um, the, the fortnight of the 14th, but he marks August 12 as Exeter. So three camp meetings from the beginning of the midnight cry to, through to um, <coughs> the, the way mark we would associate with it from uh, July 21 at uh, Boston, August 1 Concord, August 12 Exeter. And this is the swelling of the loud cry. Boston and Exeter, um, th this isn't new information, but Concord is uh, what I want to spend a reasonable amount of time on this morning, or this evening. So we have here three dates which compose the swelling of the loud cry. It begins on Bos in Boston, uh, swells reaches Concord, swells reaches Exeter. And then we know that this all takes us to October 22, the close of probation. So we understand that the line of the 144,000 is a template. And we use that template to give us the line of the priests. Which should mirror the line of the 144,000. 1989 marks the time of the end. We have 9-11. But here is where it becomes a fractal. After 9-11, what is, what is um, Sunday law for us? Sunday law becomes 2014. Close of probation becomes 2019. The second advent becomes Panium. So then what should, what should we see between Sunday law and close of probation? We should see 2014 marking Boston and then we need to note Concord and Exeter. And we understood from the lines that we were marking, I won't go back to prove it, that we can mark Concord as 2016 and it becomes a way mark on our reform line as does 2018. And this just like in Millerite history marks the swelling of the loud cry message. This is Boston, Concord and Exeter. It's 2016, this waymark that I want us to particularly consider. The waymark of Concord. What does the word Concord mean? Because it's a name, but it's also a word. If you look it up in the Webster's 1828 dictionary, as you have in your Ellen White app, it'll tell you that the word Concord means an agreement between persons, 
union in opinions, sentiments, views or interests, peace, harmony. Concord means an agreement between things, a suitableness, a harmony. It's a compact, an agreement by stipulation or a treaty. Concord means to be in unity. It's used only once in the Bible. If you'll look up 2 Corinthians 6.15. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse fifteen says, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So what concord can exist between Christ and Belial? That word concord means accordance or from. So to go back um, into the meaning as you travel down the, those, um, the, the words that it originates from, from G4857 accordance to G4856 means to be harmonious, that is to be to, to accord or stipulate by compact to agree together, to agree with. To go back, uh, another word takes you to sounding together, to sound alike, that is figuratively accordant. To go back, if you go right back, it comes from two words. The first word it comes from me denotes a union. The second word means a tone. So if you think in uh, music, when you have a tone that's uh, the tones are in two different tones, they're in accordance. They are sounding the same. They're both giving the same tone. They're in agreement together. And you can know in a, mu in a musical piece when two notes are not in, uh, in the same tone, they're not in c concord. From Thayer's just means quite simply to agree together, to agree with one another in making a bargain, to make an agreement. So we have something that can mean a treaty, an agreement, union or harmony. You had a question, Mrs. Bennett. Do you mean accord? C-O-R-D, in music you've got a chord, Yes. but it's a different note. Yes, okay. so you have more than one chord, yeah. but these are concord. Yeah. These are two notes that sound the same. And as they is, they agree together. So it can mark a treaty, an agreement, or it's official union, it's harmony, which again brings you back to the concept of music. So why could 2016 be marked as concord? Who is in Concord in 2016? Remember, it's a battle. It's the first of four battles, and who's in Concord? The King of the North and the King of the South are in Concord. What Concord hath Christ with Belial? So in 2016, we can see Concord. So we accepted 2016 as a prophetic way mark. This movement in 2016 also we can identify um, in internal work. In 2016, in those last couple of months, at the same time as uh, Donald Trump was being elected as the last president of the United States, at the same time he was going into battle with the West, uh, side by side with the King of the South. Internally, we had the message of Raphia and Panium, and the message that Sister Marie pre presented this morning on the, that um, the cha Daniel chapter 11, all but the last five verses, when we look at those, the history of Daniel chapter 11, that came into the movement in 2016. So we can see the development of the Midnight Cry message. It's at Concord that we identify Raphia and Panium. The question was asked, does World War III begin at Raffia? I would answer that and say no. We are in World War III. We've been in World War III since 2016. We understand that 2016 opened up with a battle and World War II 
comes in two fronts, Western Front and then the Eastern Front. The Western Front of World War II began in 2016. We are already well into World War III. We're two years into World War III. So the message of 2014 developed into the message of 2016. So then let's consider the fractal of the Levites. So we understand that their ploughing begins at 9-11. And we can see these four spaces of time uh, in the concept of agriculture. So ploughing, former rain, latter rain, harvest. So 9-11 to 2014 is the ploughing of the Levites. When do they reach their former reign? Former reign from 2014 to when? 2014, I would suggest 2019. Elder Parminder did this in Italy. 2019 marks the beginning of the latter reign for the Levites. Panium marks their close of probation. And Sunday Law the second advent. This is when we have to go into a little bit of revision of what was covered in Arkansas. So we have already identified the way mark between Panium and Sunday Law symbolized by the number of the 273. That is where the study of Acts 27 turned into the study of Pyrrhus. But what we looked at in Arkansas was uh, in the last couple of presentations, the revolutions. And what we demonstrated on multiple witnesses was that you can overlay the same pattern on all of these revolutions. On, uh, we, we laid out three witnesses. So we could see that from September 11, so from 9-11, and this is 2001, to 11-9, and this is 2019, you can mark the French Revolution and the American Civil War. What I want to do is draw this out as a template. So I'm going to erase 9-11, you can keep it there in your minds, and just call this first period revolution. So from 9-11 to 11-9-2019 you have revolution, the overturning of the US government. Then we marked a period of preparation that took us into the following year. And at this point in the following year, all the enemies of the power that um, came out on top during this revolution unite together and you see counter-revolution. So first of all, revolution. Those revolutions all take you to an 11-9, a common focal point. Then you see a period of preparation taking you into the following year. The following year, all those opposing forces come into unity and you see a counter-revolution. So if we were to take this framework, and this framework was demonstrated from the German, the Russian and the French revolutions, all had the same framework. If we take that and make application, we understand that the revolution began at 9-11. 
2001 ends 11-9, 2019. Then we see a period of preparation that takes you into counter-revolution. That counter-revolution on three witnesses is 2020. So we have revolution and counter-revolution. And we understand that one of the revolutions in this period that we can see typified it was the American Civil War. A completely separate line of thought that brings us to the same conclusion is the number 245, when we halved the number of the 490. When we did, that took, took us to um, the 1770s. So if we took I'll just do a quick summary. We just do 2020 and we go back the 245, we have to the 490. It takes us to 1775. 1775 is the beginning of the American Revolution. Two separate lines of thought, two separate, separate witnesses to identify 2020 as the beginning of the American Revolution. This is the American Civil War. Donald Trump rises up as a dictator. His enemies come into unity and prepare for counter-revolution the following year. We can demonstrate that on two lines of thought. So we know that 2019 here is the end of the first stage of revolution but then we can mark 2020 as counter-revolution. And what began the American Revolution? The Battle of Lexington and Concord. This is Lexington and Concord. This is the shot that was heard all around the world that sparked the American Revolution. By April of 1775, reconciliation between England and the 13 colonies had failed. Two months earlier, Parliament had declared Massachusetts to be in a state of rebellion, and on April 14, General Thomas Gage received secret orders from England to suppress the rebels. On the night of April 18, Gage sent 700 British soldiers to Concord to seize Patriot supplies there. At dawn, the British reached the town of Lexington, just east of Concord, where they found 70 American militiamen waiting for them on the village green. And we know they were waiting for them because of the famous ride of Paul Revere, where he rode all night to warn um, the American citizens um, that the British were coming. Warned of the British troops' movements, the Lexington Patriots had assembled in an effort to halt British progress toward Concord. Both sides stood their ground and in a tense moment a shot was fired. Though it's unclear which side, British soldier or American patriot, fired that first shot heard round the world, history remembers it as the start of the American Revolutionary War. Sending these orders to Captain John Courier on the day of the battles, Patriot Colonel Isaac Merrill wrote that after the engagement at Lexington, which left eight Americans dead, the British troops thence proceed to Concord, killing and destroying our men in interest. He ordered Courier to mobilise and muster as many of your under-officers and soldiers as you can possible to meet immediately to some suitable place and then to march off forthwith to Concord or elsewhere, as in your discretion you shall think best to the relief of our friends and country. By the end of that day, April 19, the British had suffered 273 casualties. So, we go from Concord to Lexington and Concord. Who's in Concord in 2020? Up here, it's the King of the North and the King of the South who has come into Concord, who has come into unity. If we take it back to this model, this is the preparation of the counter-revolutionaries. Everyone opposed to Donald Trump puts aside their differences, whether they're Democrat or Republican, he has enemies in both camps. They put aside all their differences and they come together to oppose Donald Trump. 
That is the exact same thing that happened in the German, Russian and French revolutions. They had to put aside their differences and come into unity before they could um, fight side by side. So in 2020 at the Battle of Lexington and Concord, we have these opposing forces come into unity. What I'm hoping we see is that there are various symbols for the one way mark and that one way mark threads through our reform lines. So when we think about Concord, we can start to identify various symbols. The first symbol we can identify is the name itself. Coming, uh, coming into agreement or a treaty. Then we can identify after Concord, now we have Lexington added to that. So 2016, the King of the North and the King of the South are in unity. In 2020, the counter-revolutionaries, all those opposed to Donald Trump, set aside their differences and joined forces against one common enemy. So when we consider our last fractal, and this becomes about the nethonyms. When do they begin to be ploughed? Their ploughing begins in 2014, which is one of the reasons I think we are seeing the world so stirred up at the moment. I think God has a purpose in what he's doing. He's ploughing the world. 2019, they begin their early reign. Panium is their Sunday law. And I don't want us to get confused on terms, but if we mark Sunday law for the Nethonyms, it is their close of probation. And close of probation um, becomes their second advent. So where did the study of Pyrrhus begin? How did we go from Acts 27 to Pyrrhus? It was with the number 273 and what we identified was that the number 273 was a way mark between Panium and Sunday Law. Right in here we have the number of the 273. The navies of Rome by Michael Patassi in 273 BC, Ptolemy II of Egypt established diplomatic relations and friendship with Rome. Who's in Concord in 273 BC? This is Egypt and Rome coming into a treaty and alliance, Concord. So what I'm hoping we see is that this is the same way mark threaded, almost knitted, sewn through all of our reform lines, all of our, the fractals of the line of the 144,000. We can see it on uh, the big scale with Millerite history and then we can also identify it, with it um, in the priest's line with 2016 being Concord, 2020 Lexington and Concord where there are 273 British casualties and the symbol of the 273 we don't have a date for, we're not going to for a while after Panium, where Egypt and Rome come into unity. That this is the same way mark that is getting threaded through, sewn through. Another thought worth considering. Lexington and Concord, what day did that occur on? This is April 19. What is April 19? in Millerite history. 
April 19 is 2A. It's the arrival of the second angel's message. So when we consider the counterfeit, this was done in France but not in Arkansas, so you may be familiar with it or not. But if we can consider the counterfeit and how Satan resurrects his church, First of all, we'll look at the truth. Let's look at Millerite history. We have 46 years from 1798, which is the time of the end, through to 1844. This is 46 years. And Ellen White says it's the history of seven thunders that occurred under the first and the second angel's message. And then... The third starts October 22, 1844, and it travels through history. You can take that third angel's message and you can cut it and you can bring it into our history or you can see it running through history from 1844 onwards. You can juggle that third angel's message in a couple of different ways. So when we looked at the counterfeit, we identified that 1899 was the time of the end for the counterfeit. It's the rising up of... Um, Eugenio Pacelli, who later becomes Hitler's Pope, uh, you can mark a lot in 1899. And we identified that this is 46 years from 1899 to 1945. The 46 years of the resurrection of the papacy. And what I would like to suggest is that this is the history of World War I and World War II and that you can mark World War III beginning in 1945 with the Cold War. Now you have USSR, Communist Russia, against the United States in 1945. And you can mark the Cold War running through history. And that's what we began to identify in Arkansas. So we can take this concept of World War III, we can see it in 1945 or we can cut it, we can see it in 2016. You can see it in a couple of different ways, just the, way, the same as we can juggle the concept of the third angel's message because it is a counterfeit of the third angel's message. If you look at the resurrection that happened to the papacy under World War I and under World War II, that will make more sense. Why I wanted to demonstrate that is because this way mark here in Millerite history where the second angel, angel's message begins is April 19. So if we take that down to the counterfeit, World War II began, begins not literally in this history but as a symbol 2A, the arrival of the second world war can e equal April 19. And it's this same way mark that marks 2016, 2020, and down here. It's this same thread that gives us April 19. Because what is 2016? It's the beginning of World War II in our line. It's 2A for the counterfeit. In our reform line, this is symbolised by April 19. I don't think it's a coincidence that we can place April 19 as a symbol of this Concord Waymark. So Concord, Lexington, April 19, and the number 273. All symbols that coincide with this Waymark of Concord. And I'd like also to stipulate that we don't have to see every symbol at each one of these Waymarks. I'm yet to see 273 in 2016. But the number 273 is something that was particular for the Levites. It was the bringing in of the Levites in Acts chapter 27. So it makes sense that we first mainly see it in the history of the harvest of the Levites as they're being brought in. So we see the number 273 here. And we can identify it here, but not here. But they're being stitched together. So Concord becomes Lexington and Concord, they're stitched. 273 becomes 273, they're stitched. What about the name of Lexington? We've looked at Concord, what does Lexington mean? I could only find uh, one place to identify the, the meaning of the name of Lexington. And it says that Lexington means town of the new law. 
the town where a new law is passed. A law or a decree. Now we have a decree marked. So Lexington and Concord, Lexington equaling a decree marked in 2020. What is 2019 to Panium for us, for priests? Close of probation to Second Advent. Between close of probation and Second Advent, we can mark a decree. Question. On the line of the 144,000, which the priest is an accurate uh, example of, between close of probation and Second Advent, do we mark a decree? Yep. I'll read from the Great Controversy 615.2. GC 615.2 As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The same argument many centuries ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. It is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. So what we have marked between the close of probation and second advent of the 144,000 is the death decree. Lexington. So can you see how this is stitched together? Concord of 2016 becomes Lexington and Concord of 2020, marking the beginning of counter-revolution. We have the 273 from Egypt in Rome, Egypt and Rome, and at each you see uh, Concord, this unity. So unity between the King of the North and the King of the South, unity between the counter-revolutionaries, unity between Egypt and Rome, and complete unity against God's people. Go to GC 640.2. Is this the only way mark we've seen between close of probation and second advent? GC 640.2. The voice of God is heard from heaven, declaring the day and hour of Jesus coming. Next paragraph. Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud. So between close of probation and second advent, we have two way marks, just like we do between Sunday law and close of probation. First we have a decree, and then we have time. First you have Concord, and then you have Exeter. So we can see that on the line of the 144,000. Does that mean we should see that on our reform line? It means that in the line of the priests, we have 2016 and 2018. And I'll mark it down here. But remember that it has implications for us up here. That there's a way mark in here that gives us time. And I would suggest that on three witnesses, there's a way mark in here that gives us time. Just as up here, we get time. So question, when do we have time for Panium? Do we have it back here? No. We have time for Panium here. We have time for Sunday law here. 
We have time for close of probation here, just like we are given the time of the second advent here, because Panium is our second advent. Why would God not give us future time? Why would that not be the focus? Is Panium our test or Sunday law our test? These are not our tests. It's like, it's like going through schooling and university. You're not going to sit a university degree before you've passed high school. They're progressive. All God needs us to pass is November 9, 2019. The first thing we need to be aware of is how many way marks we still have coming. If we think we're looking ahead and we see 2019 and then we see something in the future and think that must be Panium. We have Waymark, Waymark, Panium, Waymark, Waymark, Sunday Law, Waymark, Waymark, Close of Probation, Waymark, Waymark, Second Advent. How many Waymarks do we have to contend with? 12 past Raphia. So we need to be careful when we're looking ahead to know what we are identifying. These future histories aren't at this stage our test. And making, looking into the binding off our focus won't, will not help us pass our close of probation. Our test is to identify our close of probation and make sure that we are so settled into that, so sure of that, that we won't fail. The Millerites reached October 22, 1844, 20,000 in number, but it didn't look like what they had expected it to look like. And 19,980 fell away. We need to know not only when, but what Raphael looks like. That is our test. To do this correctly, I would encourage us to pray as Ellen White instructed us to for humility, wisdom, courage and faith. He has led us this far, he won't fail us now. So in conclusion, what I want us to see is these threaded way marks of concord through our reform lines that it, it, it's sewn together in all these different places but it's the one way mark and you can symbolise it with these different um, symbols used of concord, a unity, Lexington, a decree, April 19, this uh, 2A and the number 273, the bringing in of the Levites. But as they interplay, particularly in 2020, when we see uh, actually all four of these at one point in time, it locks them together. And we can also see that with the line of the 144,000, the priests and the Levites, that on three lines, three evidences, uh, which locks in a fourth, that this is the way mark where we receive time. So if you would kneel with me, we're going to close in prayer. We do have, uh, if you want, we can do a second study this afternoon, but I'm going to leave that open uh, to um, others' decision. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for all of our blessings. Thank you for the light you have poured on your people over these last 29 years, Lord, how you have led us as a movement and individually, Lord, to be uh, at this place, um, either here literally, Lord, or um, figuratively as people gather all over the world, that we are here at this point in time, Lord, to take part in, in this work. I pray that you'll prepare us in mind and in heart, Lord, to, uh, to really imbibe these truths, to know firmly what we believe that we won't be shaken. Lord, may we be inspired to study and to dig, um, dig for hidden treasure, Lord. Uh, please prepare us. May no one, no head bowed, uh, fail the litmus test that, that comes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.